So I've been saying that linear regression and logistic regression are the simplest examples of neural networks. And in this video, we're going to take the step from logistic regression to neural networks. Neural networks are like a natural generalization of the idea of logistic regression. So let's review the framework for multi-class logistic regression. We're given training data consisting of a list of feature vectors x1 through xn. Each feature vector belongs to rd. And we're given corresponding one-hot encoded label vectors y1 through yn. If we're doing classification with k classes, then each one-hot encoded label vector is an element of rk. And we, if we write xi, if we write the ith feature vector in detail, this is what it is. The, first, the components are xi1, xi2, dot, 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 xid. And the way we compute our predicted probability vector for the ith training example is like this. So we first compute these k numbers. Here's the first number. Here's the second number. Here's the kth number. We compute these k numbers. We, we list them in a vector. And then we take that vector and we plug it into the softmax function. And as we know, the softmax function is useful in machine learning because it converts a vector into a probability vector. And we hope that this probability vector is consistent with the corresponding label vector for this training example. That's what we do. That's, how, that's what we've been doing. That's how multi-class logistic regression works. Now this function, let's, let's take a closer look at this function f here. I could write this using vector and matrix notation like that, like this. So here we're taking our vector x, xi, we're taking our vector xi, we're multiplying it by this matrix, and then we're adding this vector. This type of function f, which is given by, a, by this formula, this is called an affine function. It's not, it's not quite a linear transformation. If this vector here were zero, if we omitted this vector, then we would be simply multiplying by a matrix, and that's a linear transformation. But since we're adding this vector, this is called an affine function. And an affine function is one of the simplest, and it's one of the simplest types of functions. And it's one of the types of functions we understand very well. They're easy to work with. F is an F. When we do logistic regression, multi-class logistic regression, F is an affine function. And I'm going to use this notation here. I'm going to say f of xi is equal to t sub, t sub beta of xi. And beta is a vector that contains all these parameters. All these parameters that determine our affine function, they're all stored in this column vector beta. So now here's a natural question for you. Why does f have to be affine? Can't we be a little more creative than that? Can, couldn't we be a little bit slightly more fancy than that? We don't have to restrict ourselves ourselves to an, having f be an affine function. Why couldn't f be some kind some kind of nonlinear function? And that's the question that leads to neural networks. If we just allow f to be a nonlinear function, then we have discovered neural networks. Now. We're going to allow f to be a nonlinear function, but we still would like for f to be simple. So let's think, what's the simplest example of a nonlinear function that we can think of? Because we, we would still like f to be as simple as possible. What's the simplest nonlinear function we can think of? Well, here's, here's a function I'm going to show you that is arguably the simplest possible nonlinear function. It's called the ReLU function. And this is a bad name. Maybe it should just be called the ramp function. And its graph looks like this. Here's my axes. The graph just looks like this. And the formula for the ReLU function, I'm going to call it uh, R, 
r of u, the formula for the ReLU function, r of u is equal to the maximum of u and zero. This is called the ReLU activation function or just the ramp function. And why is it called an activation function? If the input u, which is a scalar, if this input is positive, then it's like the function is activated and the output is non-zero. If this input u is negative, then the function is not activated and the output is just zero. So this is like a very simple function. If the input is positive, then the output is equal to the input. What could be simpler than that? If the input is negative, the output is zero. This is as simple as it gets for a nonlinear function. Okay, so uh, here's what we're gonna do. I said that we're going to, we're gonna generalize logistic regression by allowing f to be a nonlinear function. Instead of being a, an affine function, it's going to be a nonlinear function. And here's how it's gonna work. Here's how it works in a neural network. What we're going to do is we're going to, here's what f is going to do. f is going to take xi as input. And what's, it, what's f going to do to xi? Well, first, it's going to apply an affine function to xi. That's exactly what happens in logistic regression. But then, and, and the result of this affine function is going to be a vector. And then each component of this vector, what's going to happen to each component of this vector? Each component of this vector is going to be fed into the ReLU activation function. That's all. And I'm going to, to denote that, I'm going to write A of this vector. And here A is a function that simply applies the ReLU activation function to each component of this vector. That's what A does. A is a nonlinear function. Okay, and then whatever the result of this is, we're going to apply a new affine function, a different affine function to this vector. That's it. And what is beta prime? Beta prime is a, a column vector that contains all of the coefficients that go into determining this, this new and different affine function. So back here, I said that this affine function T sub beta is determined by all these coefficients. These coefficients you can think of as being like knobs that you can tune in order to maximize the accuracy of your neural network, maximize the accuracy of your predictions. So T sub beta prime is just a different affine function with a different set of coefficients. And if we, if, and this is what we're gonna use for F. And when we make this choice of F, then this, then, then what we have here is called a neural network. This is all a neural network is. Isn't this about the simplest possible nonlinear function we can think of that isn't just trivial, you know? This is, there's something simple and elegant about this. Now, we, we could keep going further. We could take this vector and we could apply the ReLU function to each component of this vector. And then we could apply another affine function, another, another affine function. That would be kind of like adding another layer to our neural network. And we could keep doing it again and again. Apply ReLU, apply another affine function, apply ReLU, apply another affine function again and again. This, this would give us a neural network with multiple layers. So we, and, it, and it's called, this particular type of neural network is called a, a dense neural network. This is like a vanilla 
neural network. It's also called like a, a feed forward neural network. That's all it is. So we're going to make this choice of F and then, so, and then everything else works exactly the same way it worked with multi-class logistic regression. So how do we make our predicted probability vector? We're going to take our feature vector Xi, we're going to plug it into F, which is now a nonlinear function. F is now a neural network. We're going to plug Xi into F, which is a neural network. And then we're going to take the resulting vector and we're going to plug it into the softmax function and we're going to get, that's going to be our, our predicted probability vector. Now, one comment I should make is that here, the, if we're doing multi-class classification with K classes, and if this is the function F that we're using, then this affine function T beta prime, it needs, it needs to have K outputs. The output of this function should be a vector in RK. And the reason for that is because the output of F has to, we have to be able to plug it into the softmax function. And that's going to give us a probability vector in RK. And we hope that that probability vector is consistent with the ground truth probability vector for this, for the particular training example that we're looking at. And how are we going to measure the agreement between this predicted probability vector and the ground truth probability vector. Well, we do what we always do in machine learning. We use the cross entropy loss function to, ev to evaluate how well the predicted probability vector, to measure how well this predicted probability vector agrees with the ground truth probability vector. It works the same way as in logistic regression. It's just that F is a nonlinear function. That's all. Everything else is the same. And What's our loss function going to be? What's our loss function going to be? Well, it's exactly like in neural net. It's exactly like in logistic regression. L of beta comma beta prime is going to be equal to the sum from I equals one to N of L, here lowercase l is the cross entropy loss function. And then here's yi, the ground truth probability vector for the ith training example. And then here's s of f of xi. This is our predicted probability vector for the ith training example. If this cross entropy loss function is small, if it takes on a small value, then that means our predicted probability vector agrees closely with our ground truth probability vector. We're summing from i equals 1 to n because we care about all of the examples in our training data set. We want our predictions to agree with the ground truth for all of the examples in our training data set. Over here, we have not just beta, but also beta prime. Beta is the coefficients, the parameters that describe our first affine function. Beta prime is the list of coefficients that describe our, that specify or determine our second affine function. All of the, all of these coefficients that are stored in beta and beta prime, all those parameters, those are all knobs that we can tune. We can turn those knobs in order to maximize the accuracy of our predictions. In other words, we turn them we turn these knobs, we tune these knobs in order to make this loss, this cost function as small as possible. That's how we train our neural network. And how do we, how do we do that? How do we minimize this cost function? Well, just like before, we just use stochastic gradient. We use either gradient descent or we use stochastic gradient descent. In practice, we use stochastic gradient descent. That, and that's how we train a neural network. That's what a neural network is, and that's how we train a neural network. So it's actually quite similar to multi-class logistic regression.
And when people describe neural networks, they often draw pictures like this. This is a picture that represents the same function that I just described to you. So this neural network, it takes a feature vector xi as input, and the components of this feature vector are visualized here. Each, each of these nodes corresponds to one component of the feature vector. And then uh, in this picture, each, you can think of each of these nodes here as performing its own little calculation. So each of these nodes has, you can think of it as having its own set of parameters. Each node has a vector of weights and also a bias term. And each of these nodes performs its own little computation. So what does this fir first node do? What it does is it takes the vector xi, it computes a dot product with the weight vector that belongs to this node, and then it adds the bias term that belongs to this node. It takes that result, which is a number, and it plugs it into the ReLU activation function, and it, the result is a number. And that number is the output of this particular node. And that's what each of these nodes does. This node, what does it do? What calculation does it perform? Well, just let, same thing. It takes the vector xi as input, it computes the dot product with this node's own special weight vector, it adds the bias term that belongs to this particular node, and it takes that result and plugs it into the ReLU activation function. The result is a number. That number is the output of this node. Each of these nodes does the same thing. Okay, and then we have our final layer here. So what does this node do? This node takes the list of outputs from this layer, takes that vector of outputs, computes a dot product with the weight vector that belongs to this node, and adds the bias term that belongs to this node, and then that number gets plugged into the softmax function. It's that, that number in, is one of the components of the vector that gets plugged into the softmax function. In this picture here that we're looking at, this, in this picture, we're doing classification with four classes. That's why we have four outputs here. This gives us, these four outputs give us a vector with four components. That vector with four components is going to get plugged into the softmax function. And the result is going to be a probability vector that tells us, what does that probability vector tell us? It tells us the probability, the predicted probability, that Xi, the ith training example, belongs to each of the four classes. So this is a visual way of you know, visualizing what a neural network does. So now I want to show you a really simple example of how to train a neural network using TensorFlow. So uh, and TensorFlow is one of the most popular packages for training neural networks. When you hear people talk about training neural networks, they're always using TensorFlow or else PyTorch. Those are the two most popular uh, neural network frameworks. Um, and TensorFlow is especially popular in industry, whereas PyTorch has become very popular in research and academia. And it's becoming more popular in industry also. Um, TensorFlow comes from Google, whereas uh, PyTorch comes from Facebook. So what's happening here? We're importing NumPy, we're importing TensorFlow, importing Matplotlib. Here we're reading in the MNIST data set. The MNIST data set comes with TensorFlow. It's one of the built-in data sets, so it's really easy to read in the MNIST data using TensorFlow. Here we're normalizing the uh, images in our data set, so after this normalization step, the, the maximum intensity value in each of our images is one. Okay, and let's just visualize uh, some of the data. So uh, let's do xtrain.shape. We have 60,000 training images. Each training image is 
28 by 28. And let's do x test.shape. We have 10,000 test images. And let's visualize the first training image. There it is. It looks like a five to me. And the second one, that's a zero. There's a four. There's a one. So that's the data that we're working with here. OK, now next I'm going to uh, reshape the data so that instead of having images which are 28 by 28, uh, they're going to be flattened into vectors. That's what this snippet of code does here. I'm reshaping X train and I'm reshaping X test. Let's look at the, the new shape of X train. It still has 60,000 rows, but now uh, there's 784 columns. That's because each 28 by 28 image has been flattened into a vector with 784 entries. Now, actually, TensorFlow could handle this flattening step for us. We could just add what's called a flattening layer to our neural network, and then we wouldn't have to do this. But for simplicity and for clarity, I'm just going to flatten the data myself. OK, now we have to create a model. And this model is exactly like the function f that I was talking about. And you can see here a description of what this model does. Uh, it, this model, it's, a it's our function f. It takes a feature vector xi as input. And then it applies an affine transformation. And then it applies the ReLU activation function to each of the uh, numbers in that resulting vector, each of the components in that resulting vector, and then it applies another affine transformation, just like we talked about. That's what's happening here. Here, this number 28, 128, that means that in our, if you visualize that picture of our neural network, we have 128 nodes in that middle layer. That's what the 128 means. Now we have to tell uh, TensorFlow which loss function to use. That's what happens with this line. And this loss function is exactly the same loss function that we talked about. So this loss function, what it does is it takes a vector u, it applies the softmax function, it computes the cross entropy uh, loss function to compare how well the predicted probability vector agrees with the ground truth probability vector. And then it returns uh, that loss function value as output. That's what this loss function does. And then we have there's this compilation step where we have to compile our model. And then we're ready to train our model. Oh, in, in the compilation step, what's ha what are we what does this mean? Here, this this little line that says optimizer equals SGD, that we're telling TensorFlow to use stochastic gradient descent to train our model. Um, and then we're telling it which loss function to use. We're saying use this loss function here. And then this metric accuracy, that means that as, the, as we train our model, we're going to keep track of our classification accuracy on the training data just to, see, just to see whether or not we're making progress. OK, and then this line here is where we actually train the neural network. So let's just let's run this code. And now we're on the first epoch of gradient descent. You can see our accuracy on the training data is 83% after the first iteration. And now it's up to 90%. Now it's up to 92, almost 92%. So we're, so the optimization algorithm is working. We're training the neural network using stochastic gradient descent right now. Uh, TensorFlow does the training for us. So like in practice, uh, we're not going to be like implementing stochastic gradient descent in practice to train our neural network. Instead, we're just going to have TensorFlow do it for us. So it's, it's great to understand how stochastic gradient descent works, just so, you, just so we have a deep understanding of neural networks and how they're trained. Uh, but uh, TensorFlow does all the work for us. Look how short this code is. with this very small amount of code. What is this, like 10 lines of code? 
we're training a neural network with just 10 lines of code. And by the way, that this code is running on my CPU. Uh, if it were running on a GPU, then it would have been much faster. It would have been like almost instant, almost instantaneous, or it would have been just a few seconds. Um, so now the neural network has been trained. And now finally, let's test, let's check out the accuracy of our neural network uh, on the test data. Let's see how we do. Okay, so we had 95% accuracy, 95.26%. That's already better than we got with multi-class logistic regression. Remember, we got 92% with multi-class logistic regression. So we have already made an improvement. And this is like a very simple neural network. So uh, we will be able to improve on this result by, uh, by having a slightly fancier neural network. But this is the basic process of how you train a neural network using TensorFlow. Now I want to make sure we really understand what this loss function is doing. So I'm going to implement my own version of this loss function, and then we'll understand in detail what the loss function is doing. So let's first implement the softmax function. We've done this before. We just apply the exponential function to each component of the input vector, and then we normalize. So normalize like that. That's the softmax function. Now let's define the cross entropy loss function. We've also done this before. We have to do the dot product with p between p and the vector we get by applying the log, the natural log function to each component of q. There's the cross entropy loss function. Now let me define my own loss function. It's going to take a label y as input. It's going to take a vector u. If we're doing multi-class classification with k classes, then uh, the size of u is going to be k. And I need to, this y is not yet one-hot encoded. I need to do one-hot encoding. So let me create a vector called y one-hot. I'll initialize y one-hot to be all zeros. And then I'll say y one-hot of y is equal to one. So for example, if y is 7 and k is 10, then y1 hot is a vector that has 10 components and the seventh component is equal to 1. So we just did 1 hot encoding. Now that we've done 1 hot encoding, uh, I just need to compute the value that our loss function should return. So it's, let's return cross entropy, the cross entropy between y1 hot and softmax of you. There we go. Now let's, that's our own implementation of the loss function. Now let's try it out on the first image in the test data set. There's the first image in the test data set. There's the first label, the corresponding label in the test data set. Let's plug xi into our model. The result is a vector with k numbers. And then let's print the loss function value that we get when we use y, i, and u as input. Now let's just run this section of code, and there's our loss function value. And now let's check and see if we get the same thing when we apply this, when we use this loss function up here. So let's do, let's print loss fn of y, i, u. Okay, and you see we have agreement. Our value was 0 .00, 0 0.00389, and TensorFlow's value was 0 0.00389, so we have agreement. So this, in detail, is what our loss function is doing. 